Hello, I'm Dr. Pamela Ruig, Extension Mount Quality Veterinarian for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And today we're going to be continuing with our Managing Mastitis Pathogen series by focusing on a very important mastitis pathogen, the mastitis pathogen called Staphylococcus aureus. Now Staphylococcus aureus is one of the most important mastitis pathogens worldwide. On many farms throughout the world, it has a considerable economic impact on the farms. It's considered to be a major mastitis pathogen, and one of the reasons it's considered to cause major problems is that this particular organism tends to cause infections deep within the udder tissue. Because it causes these infections deep within the udder tissue, it therefore reduces the amount of healthy secretory tissue that's available to produce milk. So, mastitis infections caused by Staph aureus also often result in considerably reduced milk yield. This organism, besides causing mastitis, can also be found on cow skin, in their nose, the nasal tissue, and also on the hands of milking technicians. Now, we can't diagnose Staph aureus simply by looking at the milk of an infected cow. The diagnosis must be based on growing the organism in milk samples taken from quarters with suspected infections. When those milk samples are taken to a mastitis laboratory, this organism will grow on typical medias that are used in those labs. So, um, it'll grow on these medias, but after the organism is grown, it must be differentiated from other staphylococci using special tests. These tests that can be used in the lab would include hemolysis on blood auger, um, a coagulase positive reaction with the coagulase test, and a mannitol positive reaction with mannitol fermentation. So your laboratory, you need to ensure that your laboratory is doing these particular tests to make sure that the diagnosis is correct. Another tricky thing about the diagnosis of Staphylococcus aureus mastitis is that this organism will often shed in milk intermittently. That means multiple milk samples may be necessary for diagnosis because the organism may be found in the milk sample on one day and not be found several days later. So it's not uncommon to have false negative culture results, and if you really suspect Staph aureus as a cause of mastitis and the milk sample doesn't show it in the lab, my advice would be to take more samples. Cows that are infected with Staphylococcus aureus and have Staph aureus mastitis can have variable types of symptoms. The most common presentation is probably a chronic long-term subclinical infection. That means we have to measure the somatic cells in order to determine if the cow is infected. And the tricky thing about Staph aureus infections is that the level of somatic cells will cyclically vary. On one day you may see a somatic cell count of say 200,000 cells per mil and when you test that animal later, it may be three million or four million or nine million cells per mil. So it's perfectly normal to see this cyclical shedding of the organism in the milk and also to see a cyclical range of somatic cell counts. Chronic infections um, of Staph aureus can also cause considerable loss of these udder milk secretory cells and reduce milk yield. If a cow has a long-term subclinical infection, as evidenced by having a chronically high somatic cell count, we should always look to rule out Staph aureus, so always look for it. Now besides subclinical infections, Staph aureus can also cause mild and severe clinical cases of mastitis. So it can present in, across the whole spectrum of symptoms that we see. And occasionally on some farms, some strains of Staph aureus mastitis can result in the very severe types of mastitis that we call gangrene mastitis. Staphylococcus aureus behaves as a classic contagious mastitis pathogen, and that means that it spreads throughout the herd when the teats of healthy cows come in contact with infected milk that often originated from the udder of a cow with a subclinical infection. So when we look at uh, spots on the farm that uh, contribute to transmission, we often consider milking time to provide the greatest risk of exposure. 
After cows become infected with Staph aureus and have developed a case of mastitis, we have to consider the options for resolving these cases. And in the case of Staph aureus, it's important to recognize that almost none of these cases will spontaneously cure. There must be some intervention that takes place because cows are not very effective at um, curing themselves of this infection. It's also important to recognize that when we do decide to use antibiotics for treatment of mastitis caused by Staph aureus, the overall cure rates are quite low. In fact, if we look at the research literature, the cure rates typically will be somewhere between about 30% and about 50 or 60%. So before you start treating, we have to set the proper expectations. And one of the things that can help us to set those expectations is understanding some of the factors that influence the expected cure rate. What we know is that the longer a cow is infected with Staph aureus before we notice it and initiate treatment, the lower the probability of having a successful cure. And that's related to the ability of this organism to deeply infect the tissue and wall itself off to evade both the antibiotic treatments and to evade the cow's immune system. So some of the things we can look at that can help us make a decision whether or not to treat the cow would be things like the age of the cows. Cows that are very young, cows in first lactation or second lactation, are much more likely to result in a successful treatment outcome as compared to older cows. And in fact, cows that are in greater than third lactation, the probability of cure is often um, extremely remote. The somatic cell count of the affected quarter is also another clue that we can look at to make a decision as to whether or not treatment will likely be effective. Cows that have shorter periods of having a high cell, somatic cell count, in other words, cows that have not developed chronic infections, are much more likely to result in a successful treatment outcome as compared to cows that have had long-term chronic infections. In fact, a cow that's got a long history of having a high somatic cell count, the probability of curing that cow is approaching zero. Another issue to think about would be the number of quarters that are infected with Staph aureus. Cows that have only one infected quarter are much more likely to result in a successful treatment cure as compared to cows that have multiple infected quarters. So if we make the decision to treat based on looking at these cow-specific risk factors, we also have to recognize that we don't want to use a short duration treatment. There are a number of research studies that show that um, treatments for cows infected with Staph aureus should be what we call extended duration treatments, meaning that these treatments, especially intramammary treatments, should be about five to eight days of duration. But again, even with these five to eight days of duration, remember our expectation should be based on the cow-specific risk factors and also recognizing that we're only going to cure about 50 to 60 percent of those cows. Because our expectation for cures is relatively low, we have to recognize that the other 50 percent, the treatment failures, um, need to either be identified and segregated or culled from the herd. So this isn't an instance where we just want to treat cows and assume they're going to be cured. This is an instance where we have to look at the cows and make some decisions as to whether or not those treatments have been effective and then make decisions as to what to do with those cows. Now making the decision as to whether or not the treatment has been effective is also difficult. And it's difficult because, as I mentioned before, the cell count of a cow infected with Staph aureus will uh, vary cyclically and the shedding of the organism will vary cyclically. So when we look at deciding whether or not a treatment has been affected, we'll have to look at the long-term history of the cow. Uh, it's very typical for cows that have been treated for Staph aureus mastitis to have an immediate drop in cell count. And sometimes people then think, oh, those cows are cured. But what you really need to do is look at those cows suspiciously and follow that cell count over weeks or months because the cell count may be down one month and go back up the next month as that organism then resumes growing in the udder and stimulating the immune response.
So again, be cautious and consider treated cows as potentially contagious to other cows. We don't control Staph aureus mastitis by focusing on treatment. We control Staph aureus mastitis by focusing on prevention. And the key to prevention is effective implementation of the five-point mastitis control plan. The first point is to effectively implement post-milking teat dipping. In fact, we really can't control Staph aureus without effective post-milking teat dipping. So this is the part, the place to begin on your farms. The second point of the five-point mastitis control plan is to use intramammary dry cow antibiotic therapy on every quarter of every cow at the end of every lactation. The purpose of this is to treat those subclinically infected cows that haven't been detected or treated during lactation. The third point of the five-point mastitis control plan is to have an appropriate strategy for treatment of clinical cases. And that means you need to have a plan to record all of the cases in permanent records and monitor the outcomes. You should also work with your local veterinarian on developing an appropriate treatment pro protocol based on the type of pathogens that are being uh, occurring in your herd. The fourth point of the five-point mastitis control plan is to make sure that you cull chronically infected cows. That means these cows have to be identified, usually through the use of both somatic cell counts and some culturing, and then they need to be um, uh, removed from the herd so that they can't uh, serve as a source of infection for healthy cows. And then the fifth point of the five-point mastitis control plan is to make sure that the, you have regular milking machine maintenance so that there's a stable teat end vacuum supplied to those teats to reduce the possibility of um, vacuum fluctuation contributing to uh, these organisms gaining entrance to the udder. Now, I just want to point for our herds that use organic management practices. If you are an organic dairy herd, obviously you're not going to use uh, intramammary antibiotics for either dry cow treatment or for the treatment of the clinical cases. But that doesn't mean you can't control Staph aureus. It just ne means there needs to be more emphasis on controlling um, transmission amongst cows. Post-milking teat dipping, culling of the chronically infected cows, good milking machine maintenance, and segregation of quarters in chronically uh, infected cows are important strategies for organic herds, and they can be very successful. All right, just to recap, control of mastitis caused by Staphylococcus aureus. First of all, we have to remember mastitis caused by this organism usually spreads from cow to cow when a healthy teat comes in contact with infected milk that came from a subclinically infected udder. Thus, control is based on reducing the number of infected cows in the herd to reduce the probability of that contact. We have to remember that treatment is only rarely successful, thus successful control is based on preventing new infections and culling the chronically infected cows. <music>